Hello everybody and welcome. Today I'm going to re be reviewing the best monitor ever made, the IBM T221 and its equivalent. I'm going to do this today because my PowerBook G4 is for sale and it seems that it's the only computer I have now that can drive the T221 uh, at its full capacity. The T220 and the T221 were sold between 2001 and 2005 and have a native resolution by, of 3840 by 2400 pixels and that's on a 22 by 2 inch display. That was the highest resolution available in the market for many many years with a pixel density of 204 pixels per inch only su uh, surpassed very recently by smartphones and now by the 5K and 8K displays. Even the 4K displays didn't have higher density because they were all 16x9, whereas the T221 is 16x10. The initial model was the T220, also known as DG0. It was introduced in June 2001 and uh, had to use two LFH 6C connectors, so it's very hard to drive these days. It used to come bundled with a Matrox G200 and two power supplies. The screen would be divided in four columns of uh, 96 by 2400 pixels and each line of signal would drive one quarter of the screen. The native refresh rate was 41 Hz. Afterwards, IBM released the DG1. It used only one power supply, although now 135 watts, and supported many more resolution modes. It could be driven by single double quad link with 13, 25 or 41 hertz with a refresh rate, but would always internally run at 41 hertz. It stopped being sold in 2003, the DG3 and the DG1, when IBM introduced the DG5 uh, that supported 48 hertz and included an, a very rare external converter box that could take a dual link DVI signal and then split into two single link DVIs, one carrying odd and one carrying even pixels. So the screen could do 24 or 25 hertz uh, using the box and a single dual link DVI cable. With the four cables, it could be full 4K, 16 by 10 uh, at 48 hertz. The DG5 on here is a modified model. A person on the internet, I'm gonna put down the name when I find it, used to modify these screens, overclock them, so they could reach 55 hertz on quad link mode, so two link DVI cables, and it could run beautifully at 30 hertz with one uh, with single dual link DVI cable. That's um, I'm going to drive it with the PowerBook G4 today because for some reason the G5 quad doesn't handle it properly and I'm going to even see if I can for example try to run a 4K game, let's see if I manage. Part of the modification included, as you can see here, the installation of a custom made adapter box. So instead of having to drive the monitor with the external IBM box, you would just hook the double link DVI cables here. In theory it works, I haven't had the chance to try it out. My DG3 is the ViewSonic rebadged version and as you can see it, can run, it runs with four single link DVI cables and I'm trying to, with some success to run some Adrox converter boxes but the project's still ongoing I'm not really sure I'm ever going to finish it. This is the unmodified version, so it has an original cooling fan, whereas the DG5 has been converted to be quiet. I'm not sure how good that is for the heat though, for the health of the screen though. And uh, as you can see here, the cable also includes USB and that's only for firmware upgrades. As you can see here on the side, uh, there is the space for placing the IBM model sticker. Uh, so it shows that you know the the monitor is really really the same. There are very little difference. There is no model badge here. 
the view sonic one has the view sonic logo there the the birds and the adjustment buttons are linear whereas the IBM version has the traditional IBM or Lenovo waviness here in the bottom layout in the in the button layout just like like here my early Lenovo Think Vision it has the same style you know wavy wavy here I'm sorry for the specs. My former flatmate decided to clean the screen and left us a few smudge marks that they haven't had time to clean yet. But this screen is perfectly spotless, no scratches, and it always looks perfect when I'm taking care of it. Okay, back to the video. So, why do I think this is the best monitor ever made? First of all, it can synchronize with anything and support any resolution. For you to have an idea, uh, let me just open here RDM and that's a modern Mac running one of the latest Mac OS I'm running it over single link DVI so I get only 13 Hertz remember that is the DG2 so it supports lesser modes and if you open the menu here look at this it will advertise the computer ability to basically run any any resolution Reminding that the 60 Hz modes are actually run at 41 Hz internally by the screen and that's another amazing thing that I'm going to demonstrate soon. This screen can run uh, two inputs with different refresh rates at the same time. It's just unbelievable. So, as you can see, going down, all modes are advertised. So, for example, if I want to run, I don't know, let me not do a very small resolution that I'm not going to be able to see the menus and switch it back, but let's go for about 1020 by 1024, 85 hertz. The monitor restarts, no problem. Let's move back and refocus. And as you can see, the image is centralized and the scaling is perfect. The resolution is much higher than, 1024, uh, by, than 1280 by 1024, but the monitor's internal scale, scaler is just amazing and that's something I'm going to talk about soon. So showing here, 85 Hz, 1280 by 1024. Flawless, no problem at all. And for example here, I have 256 by 1600, but the monitor is clever enough to internally run at 3840 by 2400. It will um, redistribute the pixels on the fly based on the, on the internal calculations, and that's something I'm going to talk about soon. Let's talk a little bit about the scaler. I was all over the place with this introduction, so now let me just go path by path. The most appealing feature of this screen for someone who even has a modern computer, runs different resolutions or likes retro computing and run old software sometimes, is that you can have a single screen for everything. You don't need to keep an old CRT to have pixel accurate images. The scaler is just perfect. So for example, let me move a bit closer to grab my mouse. Now the screen is running at full 4K mode and um, of course, everything is microscopic, pick, and if you use it like this, you're gonna be blind. So on the top there, you have the standard macOS menu bar, and this is a 22-inch screen. Yeah. So let me try to change the resolution here. Let me go to what they call a Retina mode. I think it is this one. All right. So now. We are still running at uh, 3840 by 2400 and uh, it's the intended scale of macOS. It's just sending the pixels doubled and monitor the monitor renders them perfectly. Yeah, so usual retina display mode in case you would have a 22 inch display. So basically it's a 4K iMac with higher resolution. Yeah, With the advantage of course, you know, 
no glossy skin, etc. But now if we choose an unusual mode, for example, we go here and choose, I don't know, 800 by 600, yeah? So here, uh, now the monitor is running at a higher refresh rate and uh, it's pixel doubled by macOS and uh, let's see what's the resolution internally. So it actually took that resolution and made it 1600 by 1200 at 60 hertz but it's not perfectly smooth because the monitor always runs internally at 24 hertz at 41 hertz and of course my camera is captured at 24 uh, fps let's for example now go back to the standard mode so I can switch go back to RDM Let's pick up an unusual resolution um, 1600 by 1000 Now, we are probably running on the display's internal scaler. Let me have a look. Exactly, so macOS is sending um, uh, 1600 by 1000, but then the display doubles the pixels by itself using its internal scaler. And if we get closer, if you get closer, you see that the image is pixel perfect. Uh, there is no blurriness, no waviness, or nothing that, you know, monitors usually do. For the sake of comparison, let me do the same thing with my ThinkVision L220X. The L220X is here, and let's go to the options and pick up, again, 1600 by 1000. Oh, might be, that's not gonna do. Let me try, I need to probably quit RDM, open it again. All right, so let's take uh, a resolution that is equivalent in shapes. Um, for example, 1680 by 1050. Now that we are closer, we can see that the mouse cursor doesn't look as, as sharp and the scaler is just blowing the image up it's like a bitmap expansion maybe b cubic expansion or some technique like that not entirely sure but there is no internal calculation and internal table advising the screen uh, how to drive the pixels you can see it in the table that i'm popping up throughout this part now And to demonstrate the practical use of the amazing scaler, uh, especially if you like old games or retro computing and don't want to have a million screens around, let me just go to my Power Mac G4 and show some old games. With the Radeon, I have the system properly synchronizing at 1920 by 1241 hertz, and if you look around, the image is super sharp. There is no problem whatsoever. It looks perfect. Let me focus manually here. So it doesn't look like pixel doubled or anything. The scaler just does the job beautifully. So let's run again. Before we run the game, you can see here that macOS also recognizes all the resolutions, including the 4K one. And actually, if I go here and enable the 4K mode, it will just work. It looks microscopic, but it does the job and no one can really read that. macOS is designed for 7.2 DPI, I think, and this is just enorm like microscopic. Now you can see I'm running at VGA mode at 85 Hz. Of course, the monitor internally is still synchronized at 41. 
And let's go here. You can see VGA 85 Hertz, but the image is just beautiful. Uh, it doesn't look blurry, it's stable. The color is perfect. So if you go and run A10, look at this. It's just awesome. So you can have a blast running old games in this setup because you know you're gonna get the most faithful image um, besides having an actual CRT next to you and you're gonna do that without actually having to have multiple monitors at your desk. For me it's just perfect. Another thing that's brilliant about this monitor is the image quality. It's very accurate, the color gamut is quite broad, especially if you consider that this is a almost 20 year old display design. And it's just a delight to look at. The image doesn't flicker, it's not glossy so there are no distractions. The pixel density is so high that it looks like you're looking at printed paper. A downside is that well, the black levels are a bit high, I think the contrast is only around 1 to 300. I will put the right numbers down, down below. And uh, it is just a gorgeous state to look at if you're like reading or working with photos, admiring pictures. And also, it's not glossy, so... Well, sorry for the washed image, it looks much better in real life. But if you move around, you see no reflections and the viewing angle is just perfect. I think the specifications are like around 80 degrees, but you can just keep going around, going around and the image is still there. Of course it's out of focus because I'm using a very fast lens, but as you can see, you can go all around and still see the colors, they are not shifted, it's not grayed out and no reflections to be seen. So here I'm at the closest focus distance that my camera allows and you still cannot see any pixels. I can only see anything if I really get close to the screen and faint my eyes. It is just gorgeous. Step back a bit to focus. So it's really look like you're looking at printed paper and it's such a joy, nothing is oversaturated and uh, nothing is out of place. It was certified to run in galleries and tested to the extreme, so it's as good as, a, as best you can get. And in theory it even supports 10-bit colors using some special mode and that's something 20 years uh, ahead of its time. Unfortunately though, uh, the screen re redraw time is around 50 milliseconds. I think the DG5 is better. So if I hide all applications here, you're gonna see what I mean. If I go uh, find the uh, hide others, you can see the gray area slowly disappearing down here. Well, it's not a big deal since, you know, of course I'm not gaming on this and if you do and you're running really old games, it doesn't really matter. Of course, watching videos at 14 Hz or 12 Hz or how many Hz is never fun. The image is quite choppy, but, well, if you're okay, occasionally watching something, you can get used. But, of course, it's something that I would never really recommend to anyone saying, yeah? If you are watching videos or... Um, well, you're using it for multimedia, then of course you're gonna need to run the multiple signals, you're not gonna be able to do it only using a single DVI cable. And at 41 Hz it's pretty fine, as I'm gonna demonstrate on the T221 now, uh, the DG5 running at 30 Hz from the PowerBook G4.
One of my favorite features of the T221 is the ability to run multiple refresh rates at the same time, put them all up to 41 Hz and send a signal to the display. So let's see how it works. Here is actually half of my T221, the secondary cable connected to my G5 quad. So as you can see the refresh rate is up now to 20 Hz. The DG5 does 24 and that is perfect for movie editing. Unfortunately this is a DG3. So here we have it. The mouse is much smoother and it's actually usable uh, as a, like a daily driver sort of thing. And you can see here that this half of the screen is running at 1920 by 2400 and if we scroll to the right see the color has changed because it thinks a different display and this is done on purpose and we go here to display refocus and the second half is running also at 1920 by 2400 and the display syncs everything up and you get 20 Hz 3840 by 2400 now the crazy thing if I go here for example to this one should be this one, I hope it's this one, secondary works best and I go and change it for example to uh, 1280 by 1024 the screen restarts and look at this now we have here 60 Hz, the mouse is smooth because it's going at 41 Hz. The scaling is perfect and if you walk back, the second half of the screen is running at the 20 Hz we had before. Sorry for the noise. And you can move the mouse right and it is there. So if I get closer to you or rather closer for you, you see here that I have the choppy mouse movement of the lowest refresh rate. The monitor combines the images beautifully and reports uh, the resolution of the primary input. So I actually have 1280 by 1024 on the primary input and the secondary one is running at 1920 by 2400. So, for example, if you're running some sort of uh, computing project uh, but you have DVI outputs or you can use, even use a VGA to DVI uh, converter you can have all your computers running at once at different resolutions and manipulate them at the same time what I use to convert from VGA to DVI is this Matrix Tipo Red to Go Digital Edition so you can get the dual link DVI DVI or VGA in and get three DVI outputs. Alright, let's get the modified DG5 to rock now. Alright, the power book is booting up and as you can see, unlike the G5 quad, the PowerBook G4 has no problems to drive it. It detects it well and it's, it just goes smoothly. So let's wait until it boots up. So the PowerBook is up and running in clamshell mode. So if I drag this and show you, you see, it's just closed. So all the graphics power goes to the display and let's see what we can see here it's probably running at uh, 1920 by 1200 let me verify yes at 60 hertz so um, this screen is overclocked to 55 hertz and that's what the mod does so the refresh time and the drawing time is just much faster than the DG3 let me demonstrate so for example now if I take this window and drag, it's just, I mean, 5 Hz is not going to make any difference, so there is no much different performance penalty compared to a modern display, with the advantages of the brilliant scaler and uh, 
well, it's not glossy and it's 22 inch and it just looks like a real piece of equipment. Yeah. So that's one. Now let's go to the full resolution. And then you see the list is still humongous, all the modes are listed. Although you lose with uh, the mod the option of having all different refresh rates. I'm gonna still try removing the adapter and see if I can use two cables, uh, but I really think that that's a loss compared to uh, the unmodified version. Or maybe it's just a thing with the DG5 uh, or the firmware upgrade, the overclock, I really don't know. But if you go to 24 with 240, the PowerBook can draw it fine. You can see how tiny the window is. And at 30 Hertz, it's still pretty fine. Uh, that seems to be a bug with macOS. Let's redraw this screen. Stupid mouse. Uh, let me minimize this. Uh, it's so small. All right, yeah, so as you can see, uh, it's quite a lot of uh, to drive it, but it runs perfectly fine from a uh, 13 or 14 year old PowerBook G4. So let's have a look on the refresh rate and resolution now. You can see here, actually 31 Hertz, 38, um, 1300 or and 40 by 2400, super fine, and uh, the image is just beautiful, stable, rock solid. Now let's see how how well does it play a video compared to the DG3. Okay, I actually could not demonstrate uh, well the performance because well I just cannot find any video to run on the PowerBook, you know, like. I don't have anything H.264 available and anything that is 3D um, just refuses to run, it runs just too slowly so it doesn't, it doesn't make any sense if you're trying to show the refresh rate. So yeah that's it for the modified DG5, I'm gonna cover two more things, I'm gonna show a bit of the build quality and then quickly go through the specifications uh, commenting them. So a thing that IBM has to get credit for is the build quality. So here we have very solid plastic even after all these years. Of course the monitor is thick, so if I rotate it here you see it's massive. Just because the backlight is so big and you know the miniaturization technology was not there yet. The base here is metal, not plastic no aluminum, it's something really solid, I don't know what it is, maybe it's even steel. It just feels amazing, it's cold to touch and you know it can handle the equipment well. You can see more of, on, of the build quality on the back. You have a metal cable holder here, you can see one of the screws has been replaced, so it doesn't look as mint as the ViewSonic I have, the ViewSonic just looks perfect, a collectible. Cable holder, very thick plastic for the two DVI cables. Or maybe here you should go push the DVI and the power one in. I guess the owner never put back the cover here, so the IBM cover is lost. The broken T221 has one, so I probably install it here. And you see the articulation here, the hinges are just this thick metal uh, spiral. And you can really move it quite a lot up and down so you have quite a steep angle here let me refocus to show you camera as you can see it moves quite a lot so something like 5 degrees forward up to like 15 or 20 degrees back And in front, very simple, you have just 
YBN buttons, very simple controls, the menu doesn't do that much, everything done by software. Including at the time some color management features that are probably never going to be able to get running, but here they are. And here is basically the best display review I've ever seen. No one has done such a review ever. At the time, the monitor costed $8,000 and this laboratory went through its uh, specifications. And here you can see that you know, the, the monitor passed all the specifications they were aiming for. Of the mention here that 13 ray hertz of the motion is jerky, of course, and 1920 by 1200 is tolerable, uh, but of course, that's obvious. And let's see what they go through here. So, this is science, yeah. So, they use like spectro, radiometer, oscilloscopes, photometers, and uh, yeah. Angle measuring too, well provided by IBM. Um, so let's see how it goes here. We have uh, so that's a setup of the review. So the monitor is here. Then you have like the white box isolating it. Um, contrast ratio is pretty good. So of course, if the ambient light is very high, then you get less contrast. And, but the dynamic range is pretty decent, even if you consider that the screen is super, super, super old. So they measured here from 375 to 1 up to 158 to 1. 158 to 1 is bad, uh, but well, tolerable. I'm usually on a half lit room, and uh, for me, it works pretty well, even for photo editing. The luminance here measured, yeah, I don't know what that means, never mind. Here you have some uniformity numbers and uh, the color coverage based on the, on the center of the screen. And uh, unfortunately, the color coverage is against CIE and people usually go measure against Adobe RGB. I'm going to put a picture light, uh, but it's really hard to compare. Color temperature, so it has passed the test. It is basically colder than the warmer, warmer than the CRT and the others in the Samsung LCD. The LCD from Samsung is very unstable, but the IBM is really flat here. They measure bit depth, and uh, using the Matrox DVI graphics card, the one that usually IBM provided, and let's see the conclusions. Whoa. Okay, I have no idea what that means. But it is here. <laughs> contrast. Ah, you can see variation of contrast based on position of the screen. Pretty stable, as you can see. It's on the side. And yes, as I mentioned, the screen is pretty slow here. So you have seconds, 70 seconds for decay, and that's on the worst case scenario, yeah. But, you know, in general, you get pretty good in five seconds. So if you are just doing photos, it's pretty fine. The measure straightness, I've never seen anyone testing these on a monitor. And of course, it's an LCD panel compared to a CRT it goes pretty well. Here have some waviness, exaggerate on 10 times scale. So waviness never, ex never exceeds 0.04%, which means, well, it's straight. I 
according to them it takes like around 10 minutes for a good warm up which is pretty okay and then the luminance is pretty stable throughout the time uh, nowadays LEDs just go straight to action instantly but that was a problem at the time yes so ideally you should wait 30 minutes for the black luminance to be stable which is well if I turn this monitor on I usually use it for two or three hours uh, depending on what I'm doing so here it is Briggs score have no idea uh, Effective pixels. I haven't checked the T221, but my DG3, the ViewSonic, is pretty perfect. I haven't seen any dead pixel on it. So, in your test, only five defective pixels. If you count, that's a 9 megapixel display made in the early 2000s. It's just a fantastic quality. And of course, you're spending 8, 9, 10, up to $20,000 on it. So, you expect a perfect screen. The viewing angle uh, is pretty broad, as I already showed and mentioned. And here you have a chart showing uh, the gray level against position angle based on you know your position related to the screen. And its performance is great, fantastic, even for uh, modern standards. Color gamut. So again, this is against CIE. So it's not a good against the, the CRT, but against the other LCD is pretty good. And I would say it's covering like 80 something percent of Adobe RGB, maybe a bit more. Uh, I tried to do a comparison, I would try to put the picture there, but um, it's pretty good. It's not perfect if you're doing super color great work nowadays or you need a broad viewing uh, color range you're gonna do something else do something else but if you want a multi-purpose monitor this is pretty good all right to finish with this video i'd like to go to the specifications uh, from ID Tech. ID Tech was a joint venture between IBM and Sony and some other people, I don't know, maybe not Sony, to uh, produce the, dis the display. Yeah. So let's quickly go through it. Here I have a review of the models. Uh, this is from 2002, so it's probably missing, yeah, April 2002, so it's probably missing the DG5, but should cover most things, yeah. So here we have resolution 3800 by 2400 and uh, IPS screen, it was on the first ones, 235 candelas uh, per square meter, so it's quite good. Viewing angle 85 degrees up and down and uh, power consumption 150 watts max, 135 typical and then you have like the option of four DVI channels. And here is the cool thing, yeah, so that's how the magic goes. The graphics adapter sends the interface and then you have the controllers driving the stripes as you wish. And the DG3 I have in DG5 can drive square, um, square uh, stripe. stripes, stripes square, so like 1920 by 1200 four times. And then you have also like if you have a DVI, you have the 60 pin cable that I mentioned before and go to the display. Here's all the supported resolutions. I think you can do more of them, but that's what is the native, yeah? So how many channels you are using? Uh, you have the four times 1920 by 1200 and that's part of the scalar magic. Yeah? So 1024, the screen is actually doing 3072 by 2304 and the scaling is perfect, yes, so there is no blurriness, nothing. Here 1020, 1020 by 1024 is actually doing 256 by 2048, so of course sometimes you have black bars around, but that's basically it. And here 
the function of the scaling, yes, so 5x5 five five pixels on VGA, 1x1 one one on top resolution, of course, fan patterns for troubleshooting, and if we go down, we have a mechanical diagram of the dimensions, it's huge and heavy, and let's go through, this is very detailed, so inputs, how the scaler works, so we have the, the, the input goes, goes to the scaler, goes to the screen, and how here, how it handles the, the input, so we have four times DVI in vertical stripes or in uh, um, 16 by 10 tiles. Here they specify every single mode, how it works, so it's a very detailed document. Uh, let's go through it quickly. So we have a gray levels, um, white balance, chromacity, so... Uh, yeah, and this interesting backlight lives is paid to 30,000 hours, so that should be up to 80% quality, which means that few of these displays are still going to be very bright because I don't really think people were using them so much. The ViewSonic I use the most is super, super, super bright.